The title of my sermon this evening is Teachers of Good Things, and it's part two. So a few weeks ago, or about a month or so ago, I preached Teachers of Good Things, part one, where I focused here, look at verse number, uh, let's look at verse number three, where the Bible read, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as become of holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now, in this passage, we have eight things that the Bible says are the, uh, that women are supposed to teach. The older women are supposed to teach the younger women, and they're uh, quantified as being good things. Now, because this list has so many things, I couldn't cram it all in just one sermon. I felt like I wasn't going to do a very good job of that, so I just did the first four. So this evening, we're going to look at the second four of this list. But just as a kind of just a refresher, there when it says sober, uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 31, you don't have to turn here, but it says, She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. You know, sober can be a lot of different things. I think one thing that we can look at sober is just being serious. Just taking your life serious. I mean, when you're not sober, are you really taking your life seriously when you're drunk or when you're uh, just not even smart? A lot of times women will sometimes pride themselves on being what's called ditzy or being stupid. They'll act stupid on purpose around guys, around people, because they think that guys want to be, you know, have a ditzy girl or a dumb girl. I don't want that at all. I want a very smart woman who takes her life seriously, who's very sober about her role in life. Very sober about who she is. Very sober about the importance of a woman, of a wife, of a mother, of just a daughter of God, of someone who can go out and preach the gospel. There's a lot of value in women. Look, they're just as valuable as men. They're not second-class citizens. They're just as valuable. And a woman that decides that she doesn't want to be sober, she doesn't want to take her life seriously, that's something she needs to be taught by older women. Older women who've taken their life serious. Older women have, who, who, who realize the importance of their life, realize the impact that they have on other people, saying, look, you need to take your life seriously. That's one of the things the older women need to teach the younger women. And we see that she openeth her mouth with wisdom. A woman who didn't take her life soberly, she can't, she's not going to be open her mouth with wisdom. She's going to be open her mouth with regret, with all the bad stories and all the, the heartache and all the wicked stuff that she did. Now the wise woman who's older, she's going to be able to open her mouth with wisdom because she was diligent. The second thing there was is love, her, love their husbands. That's something that the older women need to teach the younger women. And unfortunately today, we see so much divorce. We so, see so much, you know, marital unrest. We see so many problems. We see so many people that, you know, are constantly committing adultery and all these different things. But, and I think it's frankly because there's a dearth in the land. There's not just all these older women who are ready and willing to instruct the young women in how to live their lives, how to have a successful marriage, how to do it right. And because they're failing, because they have failed, they usually give bad advice. They give wrong advice. They teach the young women not to love their husbands, not to be faithful unto their husbands, not to submit unto their husbands. They teach them contrary to the Bible because they fail. And a failure doesn't know how to succeed. You know, one thing that you should take from the Bible or you should just take as a general principle, don't get advice from somebody who's failed. Right. Don't, don't find somebody that really is terrible at something and say, how do you do it? Hey, you, you tried to be a carpenter, and you, the house that you built just fell down, and it, it was just rotten, and it didn't even work? Will you teach me how to build a house? I mean, that doesn't even make any sense. You should, you should learn from somebody that's successful. That's right. You should learn from somebody, hey, this person's been married 50 years, 60 years, they still are happy, they're still having a good marriage. Emphasize what they're teaching you. Emphasize what they are instructing you. You know, if you're going to learn doctrine, why don't you learn it from a saved pastor that actually knows what he's talking about from the Bible? Don't go on YouTube and find some 20-year-old punk that just decides that he knows the Bible. Oh, he's really authoritative. No, learn it from somebody that's successful, that knows what they're talking about, that has experience in all areas of life. You say, man, I'm really looking for a wife? I'm really looking for a husband? Don't ask other single people what, how they should find a wife. Hey, I know you've never been married. I know you've never found a spouse. Will you instruct me of, of the best ways to find a spouse? Don't do it. God, find somebody that is married. Find somebody that is successfully and happily married and emulate that. Emulate people that are successful. 
Now, I'm not saying you go after carnal success. I'm just saying the general principles of the Bible, we see the people that are blessed by God, the people that are doing it right, those are the people that you want to try and seek counsel from. And we see the elder women who are successful, who have had a good marriage, who have loved their husbands, they're invaluable. I mean, they have so much value to be able to just teach the other women. Just be a good example. You know, a lot of times, unfortunately, you know, people de-emphasize the importance of just maybe a pastor's wife. You know, a pastor's wife sets the example for a lot of the women in the church. They look at whatever the pastor's wife's doing, and that's how they decide their standard is. However, the, however she dresses, that's the highest standard. However she dresses her kids, that's the highest standard. However she deals with her family at home, that's the highest standard. And I'm not saying that that's biblical or that's exactly right. It's just human nature. It's just human nature that they're going to look at the, the elder women in the church or they're going to look at the people they have respect for and say, that must be what I am supposed to do. So someone that's in Christian service, someone that's in a position of leadership, they should decide, is what decision I'm making going to be good for other people too? You know, maybe, maybe this might seem lawful fun to me, but is it going to cause my brother to stumble? Maybe I need to have really high standards for myself just so that I'll encourage other people to live godly, to do the right thing. I don't need to just, you know, live on the edge. Some people ask me, they'll be like, where do you think exactly the line is for sin? And I say, look, I'm not trying to see how close I can get to the line. I'm trying to stay as far away from the line as possible from sin. You say, well, is every single TV show on the TV a sin? Look, I don't really care because I'm not trying to find the line. I'm just going to abstain from all appearance of evil. I'm just going to throw the wicked thing in the trash can because like 99% of it is wicked as hell and it's obviously a sin. Okay? And you know, some people, they're trying to find that line. They just want to find that gray area to live their life in. I'm not looking for that. I want to find, you know, how I can live righteously and godly. Let's keep, let's speed up a little bit. Look at, love their children. This is just a refresher. You know, Women need to love their children. And unfortunately today, it's, it's not happening. They're, they're ready to drop their kids off. They're ready to drop their kids off at don't care. They're ready to drop them off at the nursery. They're ready to drop them off at the public school. They're ready to drop them off at the babysitter. They're ready to drop them off at some other person. They don't want them to be around. They don't even like being around their children. I mean, they're constantly frustrated with it, and they don't even do it the majority of the day. Just a few hours they have with their kids, they're just frustrated with their kids. This is not the example that we should have. We should have the older women who raise their children and say, look, you better take every second you have your children precious. You better just love them and be with them and realize you're not going to have them forever. They're going to grow up. And you're not, they're not going to go any younger. Not only that, it says the Bible, they should be discreet. It says but the, in the 1 Peter chapter 3, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. The Bible says something that's very attractive about a woman is when she's discreet. What does that mean? It means she doesn't just open her mouth and just blab just you know, foolishness. Just blab something that she shouldn't say. Be in a, in a situation where maybe there's an elephant in the room and they just say it. And you're just like, whoa, why? You know, I know that was something obvious, but use a little bit of discretion. You don't always have to say everything that's on your mind. You don't always have to say, man, that dress just looks really ugly on you, honey. Why are you wearing that thing? Oh man, your hair looks really bad today. You know, oh, what'd you do? Did you fall down and like, you know, fall down in some like crayons or colors? You, your makeup's all messed up, honey. I mean, you don't have to just say everything that comes to your mind. You don't have to just say, man, you look ugly today. You look terrible. You don't have to just point out every single fault. We see sometimes though, women, they can't control their tongue. And they don't have any discretion. They don't hold, they don't restrain themselves. And the Bible says a meek and quiet spirit is that of a godly woman, is that of someone that's attractive. But let's go to the first point that we're going to focus on. Go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. The first one I will look at is chaste. Now, the word chaste in its exact form is only found three times in the Bible. It's found here in this list in Titus chapter 2 where it says, Chaste. That's all it says. It's just kind of in coordination with all these things. It also says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, in that context, we didn't turn there because it really doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't really give you a good definition. It doesn't really give you a, it doesn't really persuade you of exactly what that word means. Now, if you look up in the dictionary the word chaste, the first definition they'll say is a virgin, or they'll say pure, okay? 
But I don't know that that's necessarily right because, especially in 2 Corinthians 11, that would be saying, hey, she's a virgin virgin to Christ. That kind of seems a little bit redundant in a, in a weird way. It could mean pure there, maybe a pure virgin. But again, virgin already ins insinuates purity. Okay, I mean, to be virgin, you have to be pure. So, this is another definition that the, the dictionary provides. Is it says, chase could be simple, plain, bare, or restrained. Now, I think when we look at that last word, restrained, you know, I think a lot of times that may be what the Bible is actually trying to teach here. Okay, I think really when it comes to the word chase, we could look at it from an idea of being a pure, or we could even look at it from the idea of being restrained. Okay, look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wise, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of the hair, and of the wearing of gold, or of the putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Now we kind of see what's sandwiched in this chapter. It's mostly focusing on the one aspect that women are supposed to be subject unto their husbands. They're supposed to be obedient and subject or in uh, just having respect for their husbands. It even says that they obey not the word. They by the word may be won by the conversation of the wives. So the conversation is kind of an older word, meaning like lifestyle, meaning how they act, their behavior. Okay? The Bible is saying that if you're noticing their behavior, if you're noticing their lifestyle, you notice they're subject unto their husband. Whatever their husband's wishes are, they're doing it. When their husband gives a command or gives them some, some type of advice or the husband's giving them some kind of instruction or the husband wants them to do something, they're obedient. They, they immediately do what their husband's wanting them to do. They're in subjection. Just like, you know, in a lot of ways a child would be. Some people might take offense to that, but it's in the same way that a child should obey his parents that the wife should be in subjection to her husband. If the husband says something, yes, sir. Just like it would be like me and my boss at work. When my boss says, hey, I want you to give me this report, I say, yes, sir. How do you want it? Can I get it to you now? What, what can I do for you? It's not because, you know, I'm a lesser value of a person. It's not because I'm not, you know, a, saved. It's not because I'm not a child of God. It has nothing to do with who I am. I'm just his servant. I'm just going to do whatever he says. And according to the Bible, the wife is supposed to be subject under her husband. She's supposed to be a servant unto her husband. Now, some people take a lot of offense to this, especially in modern day culture. They think that the woman should be the one in charge, or at least 50-50. It should just be this kind of like partnership where the husband makes some decisions and the wife makes a few decisions. But according to the Bible, they're supposed to be in subjection. And we see in verse 2, it says, while they behold, so they're looking at what? Your chaste conversation. Now, this could just mean pure. could just mean the fact that you know, she's, what she, her lifestyle, there's really no blemish in it. There's no real fault in it because she's subject under her husband. But I think what he's really trying to say here is that it's a restrained conversation. Restrained meaning what? When you think of the word chase, there's a word in the Bible used a lot of times, chasten right. or chastise. Now what does it mean to be chastened or to be chastised? It means to be, you know, restrained, Amen. to be controlled. You know, a lot of people would say punished, but... I, don't, I think when you look at the real root of the word, it's more of being restrained or being controlled. You're trying to say, I don't like this behavior. I want you to do this behavior. It's trying to adapt and change the behavior of the person. And they behold the woman and her controlled conversation. Meaning what? When her husband says something, she's obedient. She's ready to respond. She's ready to do it. She's just following his wishes. She's just a servant under her husband. And they behold that and say, wow! I wish... You know, that would be great if my wife would just say, you know, yes, sir, whatever you said, yeah, let's do it. She's just a servant. She's just humble. The Bible says, look, people can be won by that. Can you imagine someone walking into a church and look, all the women are just in complete subjection to their husbands and they're happy. You know, that's what true happiness will come from is when a wife is just serving her husband. 
we think of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's our example in every single area. We see Jesus Christ was subject unto the Father. Did that make him of less value? The Bible says he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Being a servant does not make you of lesser value necessarily. Okay? We see even Jesus Christ was a, in the form of a servant, and he was subject unto the will of the Father, just as a wife is to be subject unto her own husband. That does not make her of lesser value. That does not make her not have a special role. That doesn't even mean that her role is less important. In many ways, my wife being subject unto me is more important than me being subject unto my boss. Because look, I want my kids to fear God. I want my kids to, to you know, be raised to love the Lord and to serve the Lord. That's way more important than how much money I bring home. Than you know, whatever I accomplish at my work or whatever jobs or accolades I have at my job. Look, if one of us is going to succeed more than the other, I want my wife to succeed. I want my wife. Her job is so important being with those children. But we're going to look at it in the, the latter part of this, this sermon. We're going to look more into that. But I want to focus on what the Bible's teaching here because it says the older women are supposed to be teaching the younger women to be chaste. So it's not necessarily that the, the husbands are teaching here. In this context, it's the older women that are teaching them. And I think for a woman that wants to be godly, she must have a teachable or a correctable spirit. When she's being taught by what? Either the Word of God or by an elder woman. By an older woman that wants to teach her and say, hey, you should be subject unto your husband. You know, maybe they're talking and the husband says something. She's like, I don't know if I want to do that. And the older woman saying, hey, you should do what your husband says. That's better for you to just go ahead and obey your husband. It's better for you to just do what your husband wants. I promise you. Look, I've been married for 50 years. I've been married for 60 years. And if I had just done what my husband said every time, I know I would have been happier. Every time that I disobeyed, it always went poorly. I always had constant conflict. You know, our relationship wasn't as good. We were constantly fighting. He was just angry. Look, when you're subject unto your husband, you're going to be in the will of God. Go if you would to Deuteronomy chapter 8 now. The Bible says the opposite of a godly woman. It says in Proverbs 21, it says it's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. The Bible says the opposite of this woman in subjection, she's contentious. Every time her husband tells her to do something, she says, why? I don't want to do that. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to wear that. I'm not going to make that. I don't want the kids to do that. No, I'm not going to do it. No, she's just constantly contentious. Everything the husband says, she just has to argue with it. Well, why'd you say that? Well, why'd you do that? I don't want to do that. No, it's just so annoying. It's so irritating. It makes a man just angry. It doesn't help the relationship. If I was to do that to my boss at work, I'd be fired in the day before the day was over. <laughs> if my boss is like, hey, I want you to build this website for me. Why? I don't like websites. I don't want to, I don't want to do the website. No. No, I'm going to do it how I want. No. Get out. You're fired. Get out of here. I mean, it's ludicrous. But we see women today, they think this is totally acceptable. And you know, when people are observing this, they think it's just as ridiculous when a wife is acting like this to her husband. When a wife is sitting there and just griping and complaining and just contesting every single thing that comes out of his mouth. Look, you should have just as much respect for your husband as you would a boss at work. I mean, more so. I mean, it's your husband. The guy who married you. The guy that wants to live, his, you know, serve you and provide for you and take care of you. Oh, I can't obey him, but I can obey the boss at work. It's ridiculous. The Bible says in Proverbs 7, it says that the, uh, the woman in attire of a harlot, she's loud and stubborn. She doesn't want to be corrected. She doesn't want to be taught. She's already got her ideas. She's really loud about it. I'm not going to do what he said. My husband said he wants me to come back in. I'm not going to do it. She's real loud and stubborn. It's not godly. It's wicked. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 26, Then will I, contrary, then will I walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I even I will chastise you seven times for your sins. Now look at Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 5. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son... So the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. So what, are, what word are we focusing on? We're focusing on being chaste. And if we look at a lot of other words that are like this in the Bible, like chasten, like chastise, 
We see that the Lord God chastens His children. He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom He receiveth. Why? Because He loves them. Because He wants them to not do wickedly. He wants them to not do wrong. Why would a husband make up a rule for his wife? Because He loves her. Because He doesn't want anything bad to happen to her. Because He doesn't want her to do something that's going to harm her. Why did God give us commandments? Just because He thought it was fun? Just because he thought it was a cool, hey, let's just make up some rules. You know, don't wear a linen garment. And, you know, don't put on that which pertains to a woman if you're a man. And, you know, don't, let's just kill the sodomites. It's just fun. No, he did it for our benefit. He did it for us to be saved, to, to love the Lord, to be able to serve him. Everything is for our benefit. And a loving husband, he'll make rules for his wife because he loves her. Because he wants good unto her. Because he wants her to serve the Lord. And for a woman to be chaste, she needs to hear from older women, hey, when my husband says something, I do it. You should too. When your husband gives you, you know, a rule, they shouldn't be sitting there gal palling around like, oh yeah? Well, when my husband said this, I said this to him. I said, you know, you're just lazy and you're just a jerk and I don't want to have anything to do with you and you're just sitting there. When are you going to wake up? When are you going to mow the lawn? When were you going to do the dishes? When were you going to take care of the kids? I just complained and nagged him, and then he stopped asking me to do anything. And now we don't have a relationship. And now we're divorced. Oh yeah, wait, don't get advice from the divorced woman, right? Get it from the happily married woman who's going to say, hey, you know when he told me to do something, I did it. And I was respectful unto him. And when I wasn't, I corrected it, I said, I'm sorry, and I did it anyways. Go to Psalms chapter 94. It says, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. The Bible says when God corrects you, you should be happy. Why? Because God's trying to help you. God wants you to do things better. God wants you to be successful. God wants you to do things right. You know, anybody that wants to be good at something, they like correction. You know, if you want to be a really good computer programmer, if you want to be a really good carpenter, if you want to be a really good plumber, if you want to be a good artist, if you want to be good at reading the Bible, if you want to be good at anything, you should be welcoming unto correction. When people are saying, hey, you want to do that better? Let me show you how to do it better. Amen. Let me show you how to not make that mistake anymore. And we see a godly woman is looking to older women for correction. That should be her heart's desire. She should actually desire for there to be older women that she can go to and say, hey, what do I do in this situation? What do I do when my kids won't eat? What do I do when you know I've been up all night? What do I do when I'm sick? What do I do when my husband's out of town? What do I do in all these situations when life is hard and life is tough? And you know, the Bible doesn't spell everything out. You know what the Bible's plan is? For the elder women to teach the younger women how to be chaste, how to obey their husbands. Look at 90, Psalms 94, verse 12. Blessed is the man whom thou chasteneth, O Lord, and teacheth them out of thy law. We should always be ready to be instructed out of the Bible. And you know, the elder women, obviously when they're teaching the younger women, they should be using principles out of the Bible. They should be instructing them from God's Word. And we should let the elder women and the Bible be correcting unto us. If you're a woman and you're a younger woman, you should be ready and have a willing spirit to be corrected. If you're an older woman, you should be one that's trying to set a good example so that you can teach the younger women. So you can instruct them. So that you can give them guidance in areas that you've been successful. In areas where you've learned better. In areas where you know what to do now. Because you've read the Bible. Go if you would to uh, Psalms 128. I'll just read for you from Hebrews. The Bible says, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection of the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness, unto them which are exercised thereby. Now the Bible saying is, when you're chastised, it's usually not enjoyable. And I mean, it's just like, no chastening. It doesn't say some chastening. It says, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. We, not, we need to take this verse and really get it in our heart. You say, because some people say, oh, I just love being corrected. 
And then all of a sudden someone's correcting and you're like, oh, that sucked. Oh, that was terrible. Man, I felt so embarrassed. Man, it was awful when they were telling me that. But you know what? I got it fixed. And then a few weeks later, I'm not making that mistake now. Now it's great. I'm so glad that they, they told me that. And that's how the picture is. The picture of being chased is where in the immediate you know, context, it is not fun. You do not enjoy it. You may feel embarrassed. You may feel ashamed. You may feel you know, frustrated. You, all manner of emotion. And it's okay to have emotion. It's okay to not enjoy chastening. It says no chastening for the present seems to be joyous. So you're going to have a negative reaction maybe immediately when someone's correcting you. But we need to try our best to realize this is for the benefit. You know, we need to have a good countenance on our face when someone corrects us. You know, even though you may have an emotion, let's say you're frustrated, let's say you don't agree, you can still have a good countenance on your face. We ought not just have this big scowl on our face when someone's trying to correct us or trying to, you know, you know, resist the correction. It's okay to internally be like, man, I don't really like that. You know, that was, you know, I feel, I feel ashamed. But we need to receive correction and realize that sometimes it's just you're just not going to enjoy it. I mean, you're, it's going to really hurt. But afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Meaning what? Now, now that I've had that you know pain, that suffering a little bit, or that little discomfort, now I can do better. Now I can do right. So that's the first point. You know, again, when it comes to being chaste, you can look at it a few different ways. You can look at it just being pure. But again, if you're pure you're going to be restrained. You're going to be, you know, accepting of the chastisement that comes from the Lord. You're going to be wanting to be corrected by God's Word. If you really want to be pure, you have to let God be the one that refines you. And God is wanting to refine and purify every single one of us. Try and get the sin out of us. Try and purge the sin out of us. Try and correct us. Try and chasten us until we're good sons and good daughters. What does a parent do? They take this little toddler that's a wreck that says no to everything you say and is completely disobedient and lies and has all kinds of problems and they chasten them and chasten them and chasten them and now they're an obedient son. Now they're great. Now they bring delight unto your soul. But you know what? If you never chasten your toddler, he will not give delight in your soul. You will raise a rebellious, heathen kid that's just going to hate you, that you're not going to have a good relationship with. No, you need to chasten and scourge and refine and purify your children. And we need to be willing to be purified by God. We need to let God's Word purify us and chasten us. None of us started out just doing all the commandments, and just serving God of all our heart, and just getting everything perfect. No, it takes time. It takes line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. We're all in the refining process. And we ought never ever look at somebody else that's maybe further behind us in the refining process and look down on them or think negatively. We all go through the same process. We were all in the same place. We all got saved one day. We're all working towards, you know, uh, the sanctification of being like Christ, but we're never going to make it. We're never going to attain fully. We're all trying to get there. So we never need to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. My second point, though, or the second part of this uh, list we have here, is it says that they're keepers at home. Look at Psalms 128, verse 1. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in His ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall that man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace upon Israel. Now this phrase, keepers at home, a lot of modern versions will take it out. Or they'll twist it, or they'll say something completely different. But the King James Bible makes it clear that a woman, a godly woman, is supposed to be a keeper at home. And you know what? They're supposed to be taught this by the elder women. By the elder women who did stay at home, who did raise their kids at home, who did write. And we see in today's world, the whole baby boomer you know, generation basically forsook this. They all just did not stay at home. They all abandoned their kids. And now we don't have any elder women that are good examples to look unto to basically teach us how to walk in God's ways. We walk in the ways of the heathen. We walk in the ways of, of America. Oh, they're so great, you know, doing all the things contrary to the Bible. But the Bible says, blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord that walketh in his ways. 
If a woman is to walk in God's ways, she is to be a keeper at home. And it's that simple. Stay at home. Be at home. Be there with the children. Look at verse 3. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Look, how can you be by the side of your house if you're not home? You, know, you have to be there to be at the sides. It says, thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Look, the kids are home too. It's not just her by herself shipping the kids off. No, the kids are at the table while the wife is at home being a keeper at home. The Bible makes this clear and it says, Blessed is every man that feareth the Lord. Look at verse 4. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. You know, I think a lot of pressure today is on men to not want their wives to stay home. Because, frankly, you know, women really, in their heart, I believe, want this. It's a natural desire for a woman to be home and to be with her children. Now, through our culture, and through our society, and through, you know, exalting man, women will sometimes get this wrong idea or, idea or tripped in the fact that they want to have a career, they want to be this self-made woman, they want to have their fashion line, they want to have their, you know, their all these accolades, they want to be this, you know, you know, what made woman, self-made woman or something, be like Oprah or have all this money or do all these things. That's not really, what I think, the desire that God gives most women. They kind of have to uh, quench the spirit and they kind of have to chase after what the world teaches them. But I think man sometimes encourages this behavior. A man decides, well, you know, it's, it's hard work to provide for the home. It'd be nice if my wife wouldn't just stick at home and do nothing and would go out and earn some extra money, earn a little bit of extra cash. So they put a lot of pressure on their wife or on the woman to go out and make money. When a lot of times they're not even making very good money, they're not even making you know, much more than the, the expenses that they have to shell out for the wife not being at home. I mean, child care is expensive today. I mean, all the things that a wife does, cleaning the house is expensive. Making meals is expensive. All these things that a wife can do at home cost money when she's not there, when she's not around. And the, the little bit of money that she makes when she's not at home, usually sometimes it doesn't even offset. Go if you went to Job chapter 39. But you know what? I want my wife home raising my kids. My kids are very important to me. My kids being godly is very important to me. Why would I want someone else to raise my children? Nobody loves my children as much as my wife. No one. Not even close. Even if I just took the closest relative in my family that's not my wife, it's an order of magnitude of love and care for my children. The sacrifice that my wife will want to make for my children. So why would I take a stranger that doesn't even know her, my children, that doesn't really even care about my children, and leave them with them all day for several hours? And not just my kid, a whole bunch of other random kids. What are we talking about? How about public school? You know, in Arizona this last week, they've had this really stupid thing called Red for Ed. Yeah. I don't even know what it was, but apparently I was like driving down Cactus last week, and there's all these people like on the street corner like yelling like, Red for Ed! I'm like, what is that? You know, I asked somebody, I said, what's this all about? And they said, all oh, the teachers are all going to strike from the public school. And I said, well, what's the red mean? It's like, I don't know, it just rhymes. Yeah. I, like, I mean, nobody can explain to me why it's called Red for Ed. Yeah. It's just, oh, it just rhymes. Oh, okay, that sounds really cool. I mean, I guess it makes sense there's like green, since they're trying to, you know, they're just asking and begging for money. But I looked up uh, an article. It said uh, that the organizer for the Arizona Educators United has, you know, organized this strike. And it says around uh, 57,000 teachers submitted ballots on Thursday on whether or not they were going to all strike because they felt like they weren't getting paid enough money. And it says 78% voted in favor of this walkout, according to the Arizona Education Association. Now, I, I don't know exactly all their demands or all their wishes or all their wantings, but basically they just want more money as an engine. Okay? And there's this uh, bill or something that was going to be possibly signed I don't even think it was necessarily what the teachers wanted or was exactly their first wishes, but they were definitely going to be, you know, continuing to strike if a certain bill was not recently passed, especially in Arizona. And it was a $650 million bill, 
which was going to be a 20% pay increase by 2020. But the problem was, and the reason why the, gov the government, you know, the local government here, the state government did not want to pass it, is because they have no idea how to fund it. They say, well, we don't know where that $650 million is going to come from. We'd like to give it to the teachers, but I guess these teachers put enough pressure on them, or maybe the media put enough pressure on them. I think today they actually signed it. So for the last week, there has been no teachers. You know, in a lot of schools around Arizona, I think some schools might have still had, uh, you know, they were still open at that time, but a lot of the schools were closed. You know, I heard a lot of parents, even in my work, complaining about it. They're like, oh man, this is terrible. You know, who's going to watch my kids? Who's going to raise my kids? Well, guess what? If you homeschool, you don't even have this problem. You don't even have to worry about it. I mean, hey, I didn't feel, you know, feel any effect of this. Actually, I wish that the teachers would just go on strike forever. Why don't you be a keeper at home like the Bible said? Instead of, you know, getting my kid and taking some stranger that actually doesn't even care about them, they just care about money. Yeah. Oh, hey, we just, we became a teacher because we love children. Uh, why are you striking? Because we need more money. So who do you love, the children or the money? You know, I heard growing up, because I actually went to public school. I went to public school my entire life. Okay, I went to private school for a little bit, but I went to basically public education my entire life. And this thing you heard from every teacher, it was like a mantra. It was like they all had to say it all the time. Well, I didn't become a teacher because of the money. I mean, I must have heard that just thousands of times. They're like, well, I never became a teacher because of the money. And they always complain and say, oh, man, the money's just so little. It's just so poor. Yeah. Nobody's making money. I don't think anybody is tricked into thinking that teachers make a lot of money. Not only that, when you apply for a job, they tell you how much money they're going to pay you. They don't like surprise you later, like you're hired, we'll tell you how much you're paid a little bit later. <laughs> We're not going to tell you how much you're going to get paid. But we see all these teachers agreed, they made a contract with their employer to do a job for a certain amount of money, and now all of a sudden it's not enough. Now all of a sudden they need more. Well, what happened? I mean, did they not agree at the beginning of the year? What radical thing happened? Uh, covetousness. Uh, not following God's commandments. Uh, hey, watching other people's kids suck. Hey, I, I agree. I don't want to do it. I don't want to have a bunch of brats in there and try and brainwash them with all the devil's junk. And you know, public school is not education. It's brainwashing. They don't teach the children anything, you know, from the Bible. They hate the Bible. You know, they might teach you math, they might teach you a few things. Obviously, in wholesale, kids can learn a lot if they apply themselves. But most of the time, the only kids that really get a good education, even in public school, are the ones that apply themselves. Right. right? You know, and unfortunately, they don't get the attention that they could at home. They always say, oh, the classroom's too big. Yeah. Well, newsflash, you're not going to have a big enough classroom, you know, too big of a classroom if you're having them at home, if you're just doing your own children. I mean, I've never seen a woman that gave birth 30 times in America. You know, all the, all the public schools are complaining, oh, I have 30 kids in my classroom. Hey, if you just homeschool, and max you have like 10. I mean, you're not going to have that many more. Why not do it God's way? Go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. The Bible actually commands parents to teach their children. And we see today, people want to forsake that. And guess what? There's a lot of bad consequences of not teaching your children. Not just the fact that the teachers go on strike every once in a while and you have to figure it out for a week. That's probably the best thing that could possibly happen. No, the worst thing is the fact that they teach your children to hate God. To, have, to, to not love the Bible. To think contrary to the things of God. You know, to be around other children that influence them for the worst. You know why kids sometimes do really bad stuff? Because they're friends. You know what? If you're their friend, if their brothers and sisters are their friends... You can control, you can chasten that child to be a godly parent or a godly kid, to be a godly person in this world. The Bible talks about a wicked woman in uh, Proverbs chapter 7. It says, Her feet abide not in her house. It says in uh, Proverbs 29, verse 15, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Proverbs 31, 1, the Bible says, The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. The great Proverbs 31, an older woman taught it. We see the importance of the older woman teaching, and she taught it to her son. She's teaching her son the importance of a godly woman. 
She's saying, look, you need to, this is the type of woman that you should be going after. Give not thy strength unto women. You know, go and find out a virtuous woman. Her price is far above rubies, according to the Bible. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Well, how in the world are children going to do that when their parents never teach them anything? And you know today, parents, they drop their kids off at the school to be taught by the school, to be taught by the state. Then they drop them off at the church to be taught in the Sunday school. Because we just got to model everything after America. We got to have, you know, the public school. We got to have the Christian school. And then guess what? The parents go on a date night and they never teach their kids anything ever. They're never instructing their kids. They're never teaching them anything. They don't even know what their parents believe. They a lot of times have completely different beliefs. Yeah. And they'll be like, why did that happen? Well, what did you ever show me, Dad? What did you ever teach me? When did you ever open the Bible and read the Bible to me ever? You know, a lot of times it's sad. People grow, grew, even raised in a Christian home, their parents never sat them down and just read the Bible to them. Just say, hey, let's read John 3.16. You want me to explain that to you? That's a shame. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 7. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon Him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? Only take heed of thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them to thy sons and to thy sons' sons, especially the day thou stoodest before the God thy, before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I'll make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days, that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. So not only does it say to teach your children, it says to teach your children's children. That's the elder is teaching the younger. We see, hey, oh man, I don't want to get old. You know, what am I going to do when I'm older? According to the Bible, God's plan is if you lived a righteous life, you're going to teach all of your grandchildren. Because you stayed at home, you had a lot of kids, then your kids have a lot of kids, and guess what? Now you have tons of little children that want to hear what grandpa has to tell them, want to hear what grandma has to hear to tell them. Hey, the elder women can teach the younger women. Hey, this is how you're supposed to live. Go, if you would, to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. So what are we learning? We're learning that women are supposed to be chaste according to the Bible. And we see the older women are supposed to teach the younger women to be chaste. Not only that, to be keepers at home. Now, if you weren't a keeper at home, it's going to be a lot harder for you to instruct other women to be a keeper at home. I'll just read for you Proverbs 31, verse 11. It says, The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he will that he will have, shall have no need of a spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. See, the wife is a blessing unto a husband. She does good unto him. She's serving him. Why would you not want a, why would you not want a wife? She's serving you. She's going to do good unto you. We see it's a benefit. You know, and I think about this, some people have this weird idea. This is just a tangent. Some people have this weird idea that you're going to serve God so much more if you don't get married, if you, if you don't have a wife. I've heard this, you know, from people that, you're very young. They say, well, Paul said, you know, that it's better not to get married. Well, here's the thing that I have to just face is reality, okay? Name for me the five people. You don't have to do it, but it's in your head. Name the five people that you think are doing the most for God right now. Just think of them. Are they married? Here's some people I thought of. How about Pastor Anderson? Is he married? Is he doing anything for God? How about Garrett Kershway? Is he doing anything for God? How about Richard Sines? Is he doing anything for God? You know what? I mean, just how about all the other pastors that we know or are friends with? They're all married too. Being married is not going to slow you down from serving God. And I, don't, I think it's, it's wrong when people like try to say it's negative to get married. God said it's not good for the man to be alone. That's what he said out of his own mouth. We, we need to make sure that we're following suit of what the Bible says and looking at reality to making sure what we're even saying is right. I mean, I'm not saying that uh, to be single is of lesser value or that God can't use you greatly because according to the Bible, Paul labored more abundantly than they all. Right. So according to the Bible, Paul did the greatest works and being single, you can serve God greatly. You don't have to care for the things of this world. You don't have to care for the wife. But don't be tripped into thinking, well, if I get married, that's going to somehow slow me down from serving God. I'm going to have to somehow not be able to serve God as great. The people that I know that are serving God the greatest are all married. All of them. 
Show me the guy that's serving God more that's not married. As the exception proves the rule. We see that Paul, hey, you can show me an Old Testament, you can show me a, a New Testament example of that. But getting married is a good thing. And the wife is going to do good under her husband. She's going to serve her husband. She opened her mouth in wisdom in verse 26. And the third point we had in that list is that the older women are supposed to teach the young women to be good. Now, to be good seems really generic. I think it seems kind of gen You're like, good, what does that mean? Good kind of means a lot of things to a lot of different people. But we see in Proverbs 31, look at verse 12, it says, she will do him good. So you say, well, what is it? What is good? It's all the list in Proverbs chapter 31. That's good stuff that she's doing for her husband. Look at verse 13. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. Look at verse 15. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household. Look at verse 16. She considereth the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand she planted the vineyard. Look at verse 19. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. Look at verse 20. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. Look at verse 22. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles in the merchant. According to the Bible, this guy, this husband, he's clothed better than anybody else. They're like, man, your clothing is great. Where are you getting that from? Did you get that Ralph Lauren? Did you get that at Dillard's? Oh, my wife made it. My wife got it for me. My wife procured my clothing for me. That's a good thing. I don't ever want to have to shop. If I never had to shop again for clothes, that would be great. You know what would be good? My wife to get all the clothing for me. My wife to help me look good. My wife to take, you know, heat unto me. We see the woman that's doing good, she's constantly working. So says she's working willingly. She's buying the fruit of her hands. She layeth her hands. Her hands hold the stand, you know, her hands hold the distaff. Stretcheth out her hand to the poor. She reaches forth her hands. She maketh herself coverings. She maketh fine linen. She selleth it. And literally, girls, this woman is not slothful. This woman is not lazy. She's doing good under her husband. She's doing good under her household. She's constantly busy. What's one way you can be good? Working hard. We see the righteous woman. She's working hard. And you know what's the best way to teach someone something like that? To be an example. So the elder women should be a great example of someone that's working hard, that's worked hard, and then teaching the younger women, hey, here's how you go get the clothing. Here's how you make the meals. Here's how you take care of the household. Here's how you do good on your husband. Let me show you all the things that I know, all the things that I've learned, all the things that I can do, and I'll teach you these things. You know, a lot of women, I think, today, they wish they would get this from the mother. That's, the, that's just the most obvious, just best thing. Just have a mother who's so knowledgeable, who knows how to do all these things, who's worked so hard, and can just teach your daughter, here's how you raise the children. Here's how you breastfeed. Here's how you cook a meal. Here's how you clean the clothes. Here's how you, you know, take care of the house. Here's how you do all these things that are so important and so valuable, and it'll make uh, do good on your husband. Let's go... Uh, for the sake of time, we'll go to Ephesians chapter 5. Not only that, the Bible says, I will freely sacrifice unto thee. I will praise thy name, O Lord, for it is good. You know what's another thing that's good to do? Praising the Lord. So you see the older women should be teaching the younger women to praise the Lord. To be giving praise and glory and honor to the Lord. Not gossiping all the time. Hey, why don't you stop gossiping and just teach the other women how to praise the Lord. How to love the Lord. How to talk well of the Lord. Psalm 73, it says, But it is good for me to draw near to God. You know something that's good to do? Drawing near to God. You're yeah, going to do that from the Bible, from reading, from praying, from seeking the Lord, from going to church, from going out soul winning. We need the elder women teaching the younger women, hey, you need to draw near to God. And again, how are you going to do that? The best? By an example, by doing it yourself. The Bible says, A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Another good thing is lending. We already saw that the, the Proverbs 31 woman, what she do? She stretches out her hand to the poor. We see she's good. She's a good woman. She cares for other people. She wants to help other people. She's doing good unto the poor. We see a good man shows favor. A good man lendeth. See, these are the attributes of uh, an older woman that she needs to be teaching the younger one. It says, Do good, O Lord, and those that be good, and to them that are upright in their hearts. 
God is going to do good unto those that are good. That's why it's important for us to try to be good. And for a woman to be good, you know, it's important for those older women to be a good example so they can teach the younger women to do it too. Not to teach them to be whores and go out drinking and to disobey their husbands and just to gal pal and get their own job and make it their own way. Hey, I'm on husband number five because I'm just so great. Why don't you just learn how to be good? Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Last point. Wives, submit yourselves and your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Imagine, you know, we just open up the Bible, and we read a clear commandment of God, and we just started mocking it. We started disagreeing with it. I just started blatantly speaking against what the, the clear commandment said. You'd be offended. You'd be greatly, you know, what is he doing? But that's the same way it is when a woman just disregards what her husband says. For a woman to just sit there and just, you know, argue and not obey. The, the church is supposed to be in complete subjection to Christ. Meaning what? This word. This Bible. If this Bible says something and we're not doing it, we need to just say, we're wrong. We're going to do what the Bible says. We're going to change. We're going to do it this way. We're sorry. This is right. And this is our authority. Not man. Not some denomination somewhere. Not some other preacher some other where. Not some pope. Not some man that's decided he's, you know, the independent fundamental pope. Oh, did you hear what Peter Ruckman said? Who cares? Christ is my authority. Christ is the authority of this church. Oh, did you see what Paul Chapel said? Who cares? Who cares what any other pastor said or does? This is our final authority. This is what we should be obeying. That's the same attitude that a wife should have towards her husband. The same way that we should have reverence and respect unto God's word and his commandments as a church is the same way a wife should be under her husband. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. It says in Genesis 3, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Curse it is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat it all the days of thy life. The Bible says that Adam, he should have not hearkened unto the voice of his wife. And an attribute of a man is one that leads and makes decisions. And sometimes, wives can give bad advice unto their husband. They can tell him to do something that's contrary to the Bible. And according to the Bible, the man is supposed to make good rules according to the Bible and is supposed to say, no. Hey, you want to go eat that apple off the tree, honey? No. He should have had another rule for his wife Eve and said, don't even go near that tree. And if you go near that tree, I'm going to pick you up and carry you away from the tree. You're not supposed to be eating of the tree, Eve. Don't touch it. That's what God told us. And that's what the man, he should have been ruling his wife a little bit better. He shouldn't have been hearkening under the voice of his wife. She's like, oh, it tastes really good. Do you want some? Sure, I'll eat it. I know what God said. I'm not deceived. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor do you serve authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in a transgression. Notwithstanding, she should be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now again, this is in the context of the church. That a woman is not supposed to get up and be preaching and be teaching. According to the Bible, she's supposed to be silent. That's, that's not talking at all. That's not like a little bit. It's not even like kind of not clear. It's super clear. Silent. I suffer not a woman to teach. Nor do you serve authority over the man, but to be in silence. He says it again. Maybe you didn't, you didn't catch it, Joyce Meyer. Be in silence. How can she get up and preach in silence, I guess, as long as it's not a serving the authority of a man? But she doesn't do that. She gets up there in her man haircut and teaches all manner of falsehood and lies and wicked stuff. The Bible says Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived is in the transgression. You say, well, how is the woman supposed to live then? How is she supposed to be godly? Well, she's saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. She's supposed to be good. She's supposed to be obedient under her own husband. Just as she'd be obedient to Christ. The Bible says in Colossians, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as is fit in the Lord. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, you don't have to turn there. Just go back to uh, Titus chapter 2. We'll finish. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. 
as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. He just says in all different kinds, just be silent, you're not supposed to talk, you're not supposed to teach. He says it's not even permitted for them to speak. He's making it clear. Look, they're not supposed to be teaching. It's not even a question. You know, I've heard this really stupid uh, teaching that in the old days, they would segregate the women from the men, and the wives would be on one side, and the husbands would be on the other. And occasionally, the women would have a question for their husband during the church service, so they would yell at their husband during the service. And that's what that's saying. No, that's stupid. That's made up. That's a lie. I, could, I just was laughing when I heard it. It was so ridiculous. The Bible's saying, look, they're not supposed to be teaching, period. That's what it's saying. It says, and if they will learn anything, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. It says, look, if a woman wants to learn something, their primary source should be their husband. And their husband should be the one that's teaching them. I think this, this you know, when it comes to Scripture that's really specific to women. Sometimes it may seem like there's not as much as other, you know, focused on men or focused on other people. But there's a lot for women. There's a lot packed in to, to Titus chapter number two right here. We see eight different things. And there's a lot of Bible that speaks to women specifically in their role. And it's not that they're lesser value. I think that they're just as a value or even more important in a lot of ways. It's more important for my wife, you know, to be home with my children than where I work. You know, it's more important where my wife works and where I work. I can have all manner of job. I can make money doing whatever. You know what? I want my wife home with my children, teaching and raising them and opening her mouth with wisdom. You know what? And then she can be a good example unto other women when she gets older, when my daughter gets older, that she can teach her daughter, that she can teach other young women. She can instruct them and be a good example unto them. We see it says that they're teachers of good things. None of these are bad. You know, a lot of things I said today, people would be like, I don't agree. That's terrible. That's awful. Well, let's let the Bible define what it is. It says teachers of good things. That they may teach the young one to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. When somebody disagrees with something on this list, they're blaspheming the word of God. They're basically saying... I disagree, Jesus. I disagree with the word. I disagree with what you said. And it's blasphemy. Just as horrible as it would be for someone to use Jesus Christ's name as a cuss word is for a woman to not follow one of these things on this list. To not be subject unto their husband. To not be good. To not, you know, be chaste. To not be sober. To not love their children. It's blasphemy the word of God. It gives reason for the heathen to look at the Bible and make fun of it. To, to say that it's stupid. To say they don't like it. They say, oh, you, women are supposed to stay at home? Look at all these happy women with their jobs and with their butch haircut and their, their, their pantsuit and, you know, Ellen DeGeneres and all this, you know, stuff. They're blaspheming the Word of God. They're saying that it's not true. And we as God's people need to show them, no, when you follow God's commandments, you're blessed. That's what it said. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord and walk in His ways. That's how you're going to be blessed. That's how you're going to have true happiness. That's how you're going to have all the things that God has for you in this life. And we need the elder women. We need a generation of women that decide now they want to serve God so that we can have a lot of them in, when they're older to be able to teach the younger women. To be able to teach all the other younger women how to be good. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, so much for your word. Thank you so much for every... Uh, woman and mother and daughter that you've given unto us. We know that they have special value and they're, they're precious. I pray that they would just be sober. They would just realize the importance of their life. They would realize the importance of the value that they have on others. They would realize that the role and the job that you gave them is not insignificant, that it has great value, and that they would not give you know reason for your word to be blasphemed, but rather they would be obedient unto the word of God. And that they would see the blessings in their life. That their marriages would be blessed. That their children would be blessed. And that they themselves would have the blessings of you in their life. Just thank you so much for everyone in this room. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.